Good morning. We're glad you've joined us for the Sunday morning service of Tusculum Hills Baptist Church, a caring and vibrant church that offers God's help to all people. We invite you to join us now for a special message from God's Word from Pastor Paul Gunn. The title of my message this morning is, I once was blind, but now I see. Would you turn with me in your Bibles to Mark chapter 10? I'll read verses 46 through 52. Mark chapter 10, verses 46 through 52. As we've been following here in the book of Mark, Jesus was traveling around the region with his disciples, his rather dull group of, his, his rather dull class who didn't really pick up on a lot of the things that he was teaching them, but eventually they would. They asked questions and they argued. Last week I spoke about who, who would be the greatest and they argued about these things and they, they, they tended to be competitive with one another and they were caught up in the ways of the world like most of us, yet Jesus was patient as he was teaching them the way. Verse 46, then they came to Jericho. As Jesus and his disciples, together with a large crowd, were leaving the city, a blind man, Bartimaeus, that is, son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet, but he shouted all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and said, Call him. So they called to the blind man, Cheer up, on your feet, he's calling you. Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you, Jesus asked him. The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. Go, said Jesus, your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem to his death. This dull Bible class, as I've called them, they followed along, blind to what Jesus' mission really was, blind to who Jesus really was. Even though they had seen him demonstrate his identity time after time, even though he had taught them who he was and what his mission was, you know, his followers would, would not have their eyes open. Their spiritual blindness would not go away until after he was crucified and died and buried and then resurrected. At this point, they simply just didn't get it. They were spiritually blind. And as they made their way to Jerusalem, they passed through this town of Jericho. We know Jericho from historical, uh, the previous history of uh, the children of Israel. The roads of the city were were jammed with pilgrims and, and on their way to Jerusalem for the Passover, crowds of people gathered around Jesus to catch a glimpse of this man. Jesus had become somewhat of a folk hero. He was a popular person. Uh, by this point, he'd healed people. He'd cast out demons. Everyone knew who Jesus was, and they all wanted to see him now that he was so popular, now that he was so famous. And they may not have understood exactly who he was, but word had gotten around that this was a man, an important man, who was passing through. They were interested in seeing what the buzz was all about. Jesus had encountered Zacchaeus. He had one of the richest men in town earlier. And talk of this man had, had preceded him through most people. Uh, and, that, and the throngs were just blind as to who he really was. But there was one man even though physically blind, who had a 20-20 vision, spiritual vision, concerning who Jesus was. And I want us to look at our own hearts today as we observe this encounter. 
what Jesus did for this blind man, he can do for all of us. He can do for all of us who call out to him in faith. He can give us sight where we are blind. First of all, we have Bartimaeus' condition. Verse 46 tells us he was blind. And during this day and time, uh, blindness was pretty common due to disease and unsanitary conditions of the day and lack of medical treatment. Bartimaeus lived in a world of total darkness. He could not see his children's smiles. He could not see his wife's face. He couldn't enjoy a sunrise or a sunset. He had to be led everywhere he went. And try as hard as he might, he just could not see. This is my good friend Kenneth Mitchell. Give Kenneth a good welcome this morning. <laughs> Kenneth and I have been friends for how long? Probably 15 years or so. 16 years. He knows the date. Probably can give the day an hour. <laughs> Kenneth's a deacon at a church uh, on the way to Gallatin. I'm glad Kenneth has joined us this morning. Now, as hard as Bartimaeus may have tried to see, he wasn't going to see. He couldn't take any medicine. It didn't exist. He couldn't go to doctors that could do anything more than just uh, just folk treatments of the day. There were no humanitarian laws like the American Disabilities Act. There was no particular sensitivity to a man with special needs in this day. In fact, a person who was blind was considered to not have God's favor. And Bartimaeus is a symbol of the person who is blind, living in the darkness of the world of sin, not in relationship with Jesus. You know, lost sinners are spiritually blind. 2 Corinthians 4, chapter 4 tells us, Satan, who is the God of this world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. They are unable to see the glorious light of the good news the scripture tells us. They don't understand this message about the glory of Christ who is the exact likeness of God. They cannot see the horrors of sin. They cannot see what sin has done or what sin is doing to them. People who are spiritually blind, listen to me. I want everybody to listen to me here. People who are spiritually blind cannot see the lost years. They cannot see the wasted days, the ruined lives, the pain, the sorrow, and the sadness. People who are spiritually blind cannot see that they are headed on a road to a place called hell. People who are spiritually blind cannot see that they are headed for death, destruction, and damnation. Boy, those are strong words, aren't they? But it's the truth of the gospel. Amen? Amen. Matthew chapter 7 tells us that the, the gate is narrow. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 verses 8 and 9 says, He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. They cannot see how wonderful Jesus is. I heard about a woman in jail who was spiritually blind. And then when she went to jail, she had an encounter with Jesus. And she said, I feel better, more patient, stronger, and wiser every day. Every day it's like a light bulb turns on above my head as I'm doing my studies in the Word of God. Now, not only was Bartimaeus' condition that he was blind, he was also a beggar. Bartimaeus could not hold his own job. He could not do the things that others could do. There were no welfare programs, no social services to support him. All he could do was beg and throw himself out to the mercy of people who might help. He was a man to be 
pitied, a man with an incurable condition, a man living in a cruel world. He was hopeless. And you know, those without Christ are spiritually bankrupt. People without Christ may have experienced, may have gained a lot of material wealth in this world, but they are poverty stricken spiritually. People without Christ are spiritual paupers, are spiritual beggars. They are headed for death and destruction. Well, I told you about Bartimaeus's condition. Let me tell you about Bartimaeus's cry. Verses 47 through 50 tell us about his cry. And even though he was blind, he saw who Jesus was. There's an old saying that none of us are so blind as those who will not see. And although physically blind, Bartimaeus somehow knew that Jesus held the key and the power to heal him. Perhaps he'd heard those stories circulating of the many healings Jesus had performed throughout the region. Perhaps he'd pray that Jesus would come his way one day. Maybe a friend had told him that if Jesus ever came to Jericho to grab the chance to ask him to heal him. We don't really know, but we know this. He was blind, but recognized who Jesus was. And the fact that he called Jesus son of David tells us that he knew who Jesus was for, the, for that was the name the Messiah was to be given. He knew he was crying out to the Messiah. And even though blind, he saw what Jesus could do. Bartimaeus had faith that Jesus could heal him. And we don't know... <clears throat> How he knew this, but for some reason, he saw something that the others in the crowd around him could not see or didn't believe. And even though blind, he saw he had an opportunity that he needed to grab because Jesus was passing through. And Bartimaeus was not about to let this opportunity pass him by. This beggar jumped to his feet and not being able to see from which direction Jesus was coming, he just started screaming and hollering for Jesus. And the, the crowd around Bartimaeus became somewhat uncomfortable with this beggar's all-out enthusiasm. Maybe he was just a nuisance of a beggar asking Jesus for a handout. And so they try to make him quiet. But he was desperate and he didn't care who he offended. He was determined to get to the one who could heal him. Bartimaeus got carried away when he saw Jesus, even though he was blind. I heard about a three-year-old boy who during the song service in the church went down and stood by the piano and just started saying, dancing and just saying, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. A three-year-old caught up in who Jesus was in the name of Jesus. You know, sometimes we get uncomfortable if people get a little too exuberant in their expressions of Jesus and their expressions in worship, don't we? Why? I don't know. But Bartimaeus grabbed the opportunity. And it's a sobering thought how many opportunities we've had in our lives to follow Jesus. And we miss them. Well, we must grab the chance when it comes along. We must grab the chance when it comes along. <laughs> a few years ago in my, my travels, I was at an airport and sitting on some of the benches, I saw some people I recognized. I had been to, a, uh, I'd been to an island in the Bahamas several times doing mission work. I promise it was mission work, even though it was in the Bahamas. I mean, people in the Bahamas need Jesus too. That's right. I saw some people that I knew, and they knew me. And I said, hey, what are you all doing here? And they said, well, we're waiting on a ride. And I was kind of in a hurry, and I passed them on by. And when I got to my car, I realized what I just did. I missed the blessing to help people I knew. 
So I scrambled to get back in the airport and they were already gone. Well, someone else got the blessing. I missed the blessing. You see, I was too busy serving the Lord that day that I missed the point to serve the Lord. Have you ever been on a mission like that? You are, you are just so strong-willed. Your, your head is set on some mission. Maybe it's a mission for the Lord. And then you miss the mission that's right there. We must grab those opportunities when they come. The scripture tells us that God, God will not always strive with man. When the Spirit moves upon us to work, we must respond. How many times have we passed someone who needed help? How many times have we not spoken a good word when the Holy Spirit has nudged us to do so? When gas prices were so high, near, nearly $4 a gallon, the highest I've ever paid for gas, and my kids are so tired of hearing me say this, they know the number. Is four dollars and nine cents per gallon. I remember that's the highest I've ever paid for gas. And when I walked in to pay for, for my gas, I said, "I am so glad to pay four dollars and nine cents per gallon because it means I don't have to walk." And the woman behind the register said, "You know, you're the first person that's been kind about this." And she said, "I don't have anything to do with the price of gas, but I have certainly taken the verbal beating for it." How many times have we been selfish with our time, with our resources? Well, Bartimaeus grabbed this opportunity. He didn't want it to pass. So we have Bartimaeus' condition. We have his cry. And now we have Jesus' response. And this is where it really gets good. When Jesus heard the cry of the beggar, he stopped in his tracks. Do you remember when the woman reached out and touched Jesus? And Jesus stopped and said, who touched me? And his disciples said, it could have been anybody. There's a crowd. But Jesus heard this voice in the middle of a crowd. Somebody needs to hear what I'm about to say. Jesus is never too busy to hear our cry. Your cry to Jesus will never be drowned out by all the other people crying out to Jesus. He's never too busy to respond to people who have genuine faith. And I think it's interesting that Jesus asked the beggar what he wanted him to do for him. Wasn't it obvious that he was blind? Of course it was. But Bartimaeus had to let go of any pride that he may have had. He had to confess what his need was, just like we have to confess our need to Jesus when we come to him. There was absolutely nothing that Bartimaeus could do to help himself. He needed Jesus. And listen, there is nothing we can do to help ourselves. We need Jesus, and we've got to confess that. We need Jesus to make us whole. And next we have Bartimaeus' cost, the cost. He was a beggar who had nothing, but he had a cloak. And when Bartimaeus got up to go to Jesus, he flung his cloak aside. And this might not seem like much to us today, but in this day, a man's cloak was very valuable to him. To throw it aside mean that he may, may never get another one. He may never have a means to replace it. But Bartimaeus was willing to throw aside anything that would slow him down to get to Jesus, even if it meant giving up his cloak of great value. And folks, we've got to be willing to let go of anything that might hinder us from coming to Jesus, whatever it is. Whether it's possessions, whether it's a person, whether it's a lifestyle. Don't we hear so much in the news today about people having a right to a lifestyle? We must be willing to surrender 
all. We sing, I surrender all, many times for an invitation hymn, but are we really willing to surrender everything? Are we willing to be like Bartimaeus and set aside any pride that we might have and call out to Jesus and cry specifically for what we need him to do? Are we willing to let aside anything that might weigh us down and follow him? That's what we must do. And if we really want to follow Jesus, we don't need to try to do better. We don't need to turn over a new leaf or get religion. What we need is Jesus. If you've never been born again, you need Jesus. Recently in our Arab American Friendship Center, it's been a few months ago, Naomi was speaking to some women. They were speaking in Arabic and they were talking about the, the election. They were, had been watching the news and the, the women were talking about Donald Trump for some reason. Now imagine this, with these Arabic women some of them wearing their head gear, having coffee, talking about Donald Trump. Now, that, I just can't imagine that in and of itself. But one of the women said, I think I'm going to run for president. And they all laughed. And Nomi said, no, you have to be born a U.S. citizen. And then the same woman said, in Arabic, how do, how do I do that? Do I have to enter my mother's womb and be born again? And Nomi said, that reminds me of a story. I've got a book somewhere here. And she went to John chapter 3 and she read the story of Nicodemus and she closed it and said, well, let's get back to our tea. And they begged her to finish the story. And she did. Folks, you have to be born again to have this Jesus. You've got to surrender all. If you've got a besetting sin, you just can't shake, you need Jesus. If you've got a family issue, you need Jesus. If you've got a financial issue, you need Jesus. If you've got a health issue, you need Jesus. You've got to throw aside everything and come to Jesus as you are, just like Bartimaeus did. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we come to you during our invitation time asking you to move among us, asking you to reach down with great mercy because we know we don't deserve it. We ask you to reach down today and touch someone's heart, someone that's lonely, someone that's thinking right now of their need to repent of sin and follow Jesus as Lord and Savior. We pray that your spirit would convict with such great conviction that, that whoever it is that you're reaching out to will know what they need to do in their repentance and following of Jesus. Be with us during this time. In Christ's name, amen. Please stand with me as we have our invitation hymn. If you need to come forward to meet this Jesus I've just preached to you about, please do so. If you have another spiritual reason, you need prayer or something else, or if you want to affiliate with us, we'd like to talk with you. Please come.
bow our heads just for a moment. I'm looking at our children right here on the front row. I want all the children to look at me and all the teenagers over here, young people to look at me. Uh, I know that Jesus wants to reach out to you. And I know some of you have trusted Jesus as your Lord and Savior and some of you have not. Uh, There's not a better time to do it than right now. And that right now means right now or wherever you are this afternoon or wherever you are this evening, right? I see some of you nodding your heads at me. Wherever you are, ask Jesus to forgive you of your sin. Ask him to be your Savior. Tell him you want to live for him every day. It's the best decision you could possibly make. It's going to give you a whole new life. And if you've done that, will you tell me? Will you tell somebody around you? Miss Judy wants to know right here. You tell her. If you've accepted Jesus, she knows how to help you. Anybody else around us, we love you and we're so glad that you're a part of our church. If you change the channel right now, you'll probably find a preacher who tells you that God wants you to be rich. And if you change the channel, you'll probably find another preacher who tells you that God wants you to be healthy if you would only have enough faith. Well, I'm here to tell you today that neither one of those are true. It is not God's ultimate will to make you rich. In fact, it might disappoint you to hear this, but it's not God's ultimate will to make you healthy. It's God's will to begin a new and good work in you and to develop that work. Listen to what the scripture says in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. Being confident of this very thing, that he which began a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. So from the time you repent of sin and follow Jesus as Lord and Savior until the time that you either die or Christ returns, God is continuing to build that good work in your life to bring it to maturity and development. His ultimate will for us is to conform us into the image of his son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for watching today. I hope you have a great week, and we'll see you next Sunday at 8.30.